What's up, y'all? Got a little something for you this morning before we get started into the message, and I'll bring it in just a second, but I want to make you aware of something. The water just went down the wrong pipe. <clears throat> I'm telling you, it's, it's so frustrating. It feels like before all this happened, I didn't have any issue drinking water. But now that this is going on, I feel like every sip I take is followed by that cough, that fit, and everybody around me, you know, it's kind of like um, if I could, how many of you guys have seen the picture of the guy trying to hold in the cough? You know what I mean? It's just a terrible, terrible thing. So assure Samantha that everything's okay. It's not me. Samantha's just a sweetheart. That's who, that's who you hear. And uh, sometimes her emotions, did you know your spiritual spirit man is connected to the rest of you? And sometimes when the spirit moves, she, she takes off. And it's been a while since we've been in person, so we haven't seen her take off. But I want to make room for God to move in her life. Amen? Amen. So I'm happy she's here. Yeah. She's getting used to it again. So praise God. Listen, today, uh, today's title of the message is Paul, the long game, the long game. So before I get into this, this entire message today is going to be twofold. Number one, it's going to be to the seeker, if you're here today and looking to have a relationship with the Lord. I'm praying that the Lord would speak to your heart today. And secondly, why don't we have her go into the fireside room, Linda, Victor? Because the barn doors are open. Poor buddy. I want you to be open and listening and leaning in for the gospel. But also for you as a, maybe a seasoned believer, I want you to be ready to take something away from this sermon today because sometimes the act of evangelism, the series that we're in, sometimes the act of evangelism is a long process. Amen? So I'll, I'll put it to you this way. Here's a picture that illustrates even me sometimes. Let's show this picture. Normally on Wednesday night, I like to start with a joke, but today is the first sermon. Mark's the first sermon that I've ever started with a meme. But there's a first for everything, am I right? The idea is this. Sometimes we get done with people. Show of hands, without pointing fingers, if they're here today. How many of you guys have ever felt like this before with someone? Amen. So we've all, almost all been there. If your hand didn't go up, there's a good chance you're the project. <laughs> and now you know, you know, the, the gig is up. But uh, you can take her off because it's distracting for, I think, me and everybody else in here. I do believe, I do believe that God has called us to be people of patience. And I also do believe that there comes a season in our lives where the assignment that we've had or the person that we've been working on or that individual that we may feel like we're called to, that we've just poured out and poured out and poured out with the hopes of having a good response, with the hopes of them coming to Jesus, with the hopes of them changing their lives. I do believe that sometimes your efforts were to plant the seed. And unless you walk away or at least unless you release them to the Spirit of the Lord and to the next person, maybe hear me, maybe we're hindering the harvest because we're keeping on planting the seed that we've already planted, amen? So we're sharing the gospel, and it is appropriate sometimes for us to pull back and allow the Holy Spirit to do what we can't. We had a testimony this past week as we, uh, if, if you weren't able to make it to the week of prayer, we had names all the way across the platform of people that 
I counted was over 150 people, and there were some cards that had like seven or eight names on it. Just people's hearts, you, your heart is breaking for people that you want so desperately to come to faith. And we prayed over them. And by Sunday night, there were two names up here on the platform that had already responded to the person that placed it up here on the platform. Out of nowhere. And so we're thankful that God is not done yet with the work that he's doing here in the world. Amen? You see, because there will come a day when Jesus returns, and it could be at any moment, and we must be ready, but we must be working until that point. So two things I want you to understand before I get into this today. Number one, we are called to be people of evangelism. We are called to minister, to reach out, to witness, to do everything that we can do to share our faith with others. Number two, there does come a time where you are also called to do the work and then walk away, right? There are times where you release them to the Spirit of the Lord and someone else is strategically in position to do the rest of the work. Paul's a beautiful example of this idea. So before we get to Paul and what he did, we'll do that later. There's that water down the wrong pipe again. Before we get to Paul and what he did, I want to talk to you about two people in his life. First of all, actually, yeah, two people that had an impact, and one was completely oblivious to it. You see, Paul had a seed planted in his heart for the gospel, for Jesus, by a guy named Stephen. You see, Paul stood in a group of men And the Bible tells us he held their coats, he held their tunics, their outer garments. Why? So they could have more freedom of motion so they could pick up stones and throw them at Stephen, who was completely committed to dying for Jesus. He was a martyr. The seed was planted as Paul stood there and observed this and approved of this and was actually happy about this because he was convinced that Stephen was wrong and he was right. How many of you guys know there's two approaches? Number one, we can have different opinions. But number two is just your opinion is wrong. You see, Stephen had an opinion or a conviction better about eternity that said Jesus is the only way. Paul saw at that time, he had a name change, saw at that time, looked at that, and saw this man die for his faith. Secondly, was a man named Ananias. Paul had an experience, we call it the Damascus Road event in his life, as he was going from stoning Stephen or seeing Stephen stoned and going, and he was going on commission to go and persecute the church. The Bible even says that with every breath, he was spewing out hate against Christians. And he was going out there, and he was trying to find other people to persecute, to throw in prison, men, women, and children. He didn't care. He wanted to go and persecute these people that he felt were completely heretical in their belief. And he traveled on the road to a city called Damascus, and he met this Jesus that he was persecuting. In the Bible, we see in the book of Acts, this was after Jesus came, died on a cross, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven. But Jesus made an extra special trip down there to talk to the future Apostle Paul. His name was Saul at the time. Saul, why are you persecuting me? The Bible tells us that he went blind, Saul went blind from this experience, had to be taken by the hand. And funny enough, he landed on a a street called Straight because God was about to make his crooked path straight. And Ananias showed up. So if you could picture it in your mind, this guy Ananias was called by the Lord to go and minister to Saul, who had the reputation of persecuting Christians, throwing them into prison. So it's kind of like that person that you know that always comments on your Facebook stuff. 
and you're convinced that they only comment on your stuff and they only comment when they want to start an argument and you're sucked in because you got to respond because everybody sees it. Am I right? So Ananias is called to go and minister to Saul, the very Saul that would throw him into prison if he knew that he was a believer. And yet he went because God said he has made a change and I need someone to help him find the way. So he obeyed. Did you know that obeying God, obeying God is not always easy? Did you know that obeying God sometimes is a little bit scary? There's a saying floating around churches that says, if it's not scary what God's called you to do, then it may not be God calling you to do it. Because there's a little part of you that says, I can't do that. And that's why God calls you to that, because he wants to show you how awesome he is. Amen? If I could tell you that the things that we set out to accomplish as a church and a ministry, we said, okay, we're going to accomplish this, and then there was no room for faith, then we would have really small goals. But God's called us as a people, and he's called us as a church to set goals that need him to get there. Amen? So we look at Ananias going and visiting Paul, Saul at the time. The seed was planted by Stephen, and then it was watered by this godly man. The Bible tells us that he went in there and he prayed for healing. He prayed for Saul as he was beginning to grow in his faith. So there's two things I want to draw your attention to as you're beginning to explore what God's called you to. Who you know and who you will know. First of all, who you know, your testimony. Why? Because they knew you back when. So your testimony is a witness unto the power of God because you can say, you knew me when I was. <laughs> How many of you guys have that when I was in your past? Amen? Amen. And you could say, God changed my life, and if God could change my life, he can also change your life. Because you know me and you, we used to be at the same parties together, or we used to run in the same circles, and God changed my life so he can change your life as well. And those are people who you know. But the second group of people is who you don't know, who you're called to. There are people out there who you will know that God is strategically positioning right now. And if you get that in your spirit, and you know that every day you wake up and you go to the drive through and you get your breakfast or you go down to work or you do whatever you're doing or you're, maybe you're non-essential and you're at the house and you're online I don't, and you're talking to your neighbors. I don't know what you are doing every single day, but I do know this, that God is the God of all of it. And it's God's heart that all would be saved. And as soon as he knows he can use you to reach somebody, Somebody's going to plot right down there in front of you for you to minister to. Amen? I believe that. You may think to yourself, well, that's never happened to me. Have you said that you'd be obedient to the Lord when it does yet? Does he know that he can trust you with that responsibility? Think of Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, who was responsible for spreading the gospel all over the known world at that time. From the day he would, quote unquote, as we would say, got saved or committed his life to Jesus, not just to God, but to Jesus. From that moment, it took 13 years for the church, Jerusalem, to recognize the call, to commission the call, and to send him out to do the work of the ministry. Why is that important? Well, some of us have a misconception on how God does things. Some of us look at authority within the ministry and within the spiritual. We look at authority as a hindrance to what we want to do. I believe that God may be calling someone in here today 
But I also believe that it's important that you don't get ahead of God because if you get ahead of God, you're going to wreck it. Amen? Uh, The apostle Paul had to spend this time He was still preaching. He was still teaching. He was still praying. He was still ministering. He was still evangelizing. He was still seeing miracles. He was still doing all of these things, yet the church had not commissioned him yet. Why? Because he spent the first 12 or 13 years of his life, like every other Jewish boy, learning the Torah, the law, learning about the prophecies of the Messiah. And so if he spent the first 13 years of his life learning all this, maybe God needed to take these 13 years and reteach him everything through the lens of Jesus Christ. Nothing frustrates me more than to see so much potential And yet to find someone who is unwilling to start. Let me explain. It's kind of like our lives. Young couples, for the most part, get into debt way over their heads, right out of the gate because they see their parents that has this, that, and the other, and they think, I want that at age 22. So I can just go get approved and buy all of that at age 22, and then you blink and you're age 25, and you're knocking on mom and dad's door. Can we move back in here with you? But you got four kids now. What are you doing? Yeah, but you got that basement that we can remodel, you know? Did you know that Ministry also takes time to grow and develop into maturity. To be an effective minister, no one's saying stop ministry, but people are saying is get somebody around you that you can grow with that will get you ready for what God's called you to do. Did you know that your calling and your ministry is supposed to grow over time? Amen? The deeper you go, the more fruit you bear. But the roots have to start digging in somewhere. I may, I may not be talking to anybody. All of y'all are thinking, I wonder who he's talking to because it ain't me. But I'm telling you, there's the potential in this room, no matter what age you are, there's the potential in this room to have a greater kingdom impact. But until you start, you will never arrive at what God's called you to do. Amen. By the way, funny, funny enough, we have a school of ministry that's starting this fall. <laughs> we really do. Tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, we have a meeting. If you're interested in school of ministry, one class a month. Now let's talk about this. Pray with me. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this message. Thank you for these people. Thank you for the fellowship of the believers to be in the house today. May you change us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Number one on your note sheet. Remember, God opens the door. God opens the door. You could could also put that God sends the help. God opens the door in Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, verse 19 through 26. The first thing on your note sheet that you'll see, it says, help is on the way. Help is on the way. Verse 19 through 26 reads, Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them, 
And a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. Verse 22, when the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. The very persecution that we've talked about before in this sermon series that scattered the gospel, that sent Stephen out to the place where he would be persecuted, very, the very persecution now moved things around in the church and in the kingdom. It set something up because help was on the way to the Apostle Paul. And the help came through a man named Barnabas. Think about it. God is so good to us that even when we push against him, he is setting us up on the other side. Did you know that even before you decided to make a decision to follow Christ, even before you said, I'm going to follow God with all of my heart, he was orchestrating the calling on your life because he knew you were at some point going to show up. Amen? Did you know that God, knowing that you're going to be saved, doesn't take away the need for evangelism? Well, God knows who's going to get saved and who's not going to get saved. Well, I guess we don't have to witness. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. We are called. God knows, but guess who doesn't? <laughs> Us. <laughs> Our calling is to reach out, and help is on the way, way before you even arrive. You may be here today, and you, I believe that everybody here today, of course, is ordained by God, because I believe God moves the pieces wherever he wills, amen? You may be here today, and today may be the day that God starts the wheels turning in your life toward great and powerful ministry, but it started before you decided. Help was on the way. Your life is not some series of random events. The universe is not what is in control of your destiny. Fate didn't bring you here today. The Spirit of God did. Amen? Good vibes and good energy are not going to help you in any way, shape, or form. But a praying church still changes lives. It's never too late, and the arm of the Lord is never too short, and never without power to do great things in your tomorrow, no matter where you found yourself yesterday. Secondly, remember God opens the door. Help comes from the Lord. Verse 23, when he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, talk about Barnabas, he was filled with joy. And he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith. And many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. Remember, that's the future Apostle Paul. Help comes from the Lord. Barnabas is distinctly mentioned in this place and in this passage to being full of what? The Holy Spirit. I cannot overemphasize how important it is for you to let the Spirit of God have the steering wheel of your life. It is not enough to come to church and to feel forgiven until next week and do the same thing you did last week. You've got to give the reins over to the King of Kings. And the way to do that is to allow the Holy Spirit to give you guidance and direction. And when you hear him call, say, yes, Lord. You see, the thing about Jesus was, is there was no doubt when he was here upon the earth. The disciples, there was no room for error. They woke up in the morning. They saw Jesus get up and walk a certain direction, and they followed. Easy. However, when Jesus ascended unto heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to lead us in the same way. And the beauty of it is, is that Jesus could do that with a small group in the physical, but he's made room for all of us everywhere, all the time, every day, to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. I think that's amazing. 
Barnabas found Saul because he was full of the Holy Spirit. And he was paying attention to his leading. We could be used. Okay, I need you to, I need to take a step back because this is a deep thought. This is a really, really good, I feel that somebody needs to hear. If Barnabas, full of the Holy Spirit, was used to go and minister to Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, who you and I are talking about right now, we've got to understand that God has a great big assignment for you. You never know who the person you're called to reach will become in the kingdom. Some of us want to see it in our lives. Me, I want to preach to millions. I want to go out there and do great things. I want to raise all of this money for, for good and for missions. I want to, you never know that one knucklehead that you work on could become that. Get that in your spirit, parents. That one kid that drives you crazy. I'm talking about you being called to people that are lost, but you got to start with the people that live with you. Amen? That one kid, don't give up. You keep ministering and praying and fasting. Did you know Jesus said some things only come from fasting and prayer? Keep going, keep pushing, keep ministering. Barnabas was used to reach Saul and to disciple. It's so weird and crazy in my mind that Barnabas discipled Saul and then he turned around and wrote half of the New Testament. Somebody is out there that needs you. Help ultimately comes for the Lord, but who does he use to help? People. Be joyful like Barnabas. Be faithful like Barnabas. Be open to the next assignment like Barnabas. Aren't you thankful that someone sought you out? Paul was getting, this, uh, getting the help that was sent from the Lord. Because Barnabas was spirit-filled, joy-fueled, and strong in faith. Are you? Help stays with you. Verse 26. I'm talking about the long game. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch, and both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Catch that. The, the word Christians literally means little Christs. And it was an insult. Back then, oh, Christians, little Christs. That was an insult. But how many of you guys acknowledge that that's the word we live on today? I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. I love Jesus, amen? They were first called Christians at Antioch. And Barnabas stayed with Paul for one year there, but they stayed much longer than that. We're going to uh, number two. Number two. Remember to water the seed. Remember to water the seed. Paul took multiple trips. And, and, and sometimes... Sometimes we may feel that those meetings we have with people or those conversations we have with people don't get us anywhere. But the next conversation may be the time when the shoe drops and the heart breaks and Jesus is able to enter in. So keep having those conversations. I'll tell you an approach that I take. I believe strongly in uh, the teachings of Jesus and in, in, in everything. But there was one time in particular where he, 
He said, do not cast your pearls before swine. And basically what he was saying is don't waste your breath with people that aren't ready to receive it, right? So I'll talk to people about Jesus or I'll invite them to church or I'll encourage them. And, and, and there are times where I feel like they're completely closed to that. Does that mean I stop talking to them altogether? Not necessarily. It's just I stop inviting them. And I stop having those conversations. Why? Because I planted the seed. They know who I am. They know where I come from. They know that I'm ready. The hand hasn't been pulled back, but the conversation has changed to be more like just what's going on today, the weather, oh my goodness, this virus, all of that. And if God opens the door, I'll take it. So I don't want you to cut off relationship with people that you're called to. A lot of us have that family member or that best friend from high school, or that connection that we have tried and failed with before. Amen? That doesn't mean that you just cut off all ties. But that does mean that you prayerfully consider your conversations with that person. And maybe it's time that you don't start every conversation with, unless you go to church with me, I'm not talking to you. But it's okay to have conversations because I guarantee you what's going to happen. Tragedy may strike in their life and the only person that they know that knows how to pray, that knows Jesus, that has the answers, may be you. And if the conversation and the relationship is closed down, they may not be able to come to you anymore. So they put on social media, send vibes my way. <laughs> that drives me crazy, by the way. <sighs> multiple trips. Paul made multiple trips to Antioch, to Damascus, to Corinth, to Ephesus, just to name a few. He would make these trips again and again to disciple people and minister to them. His faithfulness and his repetition and his consistency was the key to his success. The towns and the ministries that he began, he followed through with. Are you following through with the people God is calling you to? If you laid a card on the platform this past week, did you pray for them this, this week? Don't lay the card and say, Pastor will pray for them. Right? The prayer team will pray for them. That card was up here because they're on your heart. We, we did pray but God's calling you to continue, amen? Water the seed. Letters is another way that Paul did it. Today, communication has taken on many new forms. Paul was a constant communicator. He wrote around half of the New Testament and it was written by Paul to his friends and to churches that he began. And he pulled no punches. He even said in one of his letters, I'm writing this, before I show up, so I can be nicer when I get there. Now, that's not an exact quote, but that's basically what he said. He said, I'm going to let y'all know. I'm putting you on notice in writing so we can have fellowship when I get there. <laughs> it's kind of like that text. I'm on the way. We need to talk. By the way, <laughs> oh, God. A funny way to come back to the we need to talk text to mess people up is to say, I know, we sure do. <laughs> then they're like, what do they want to talk about? And you're like, what do they want to talk about? <laughs> I'm sorry. Victor and Linda are wonderful marriage counselors and relationship builders, and so don't take my advice on that text at all. They'll tell you something else. Oh, Lord, help me. <sighs> Prayer. Prayer. Many of Paul's letters begin with, I've been praying for you. Many of Paul's letters said things like, I have joy every time I think about you. Many of Paul's letters began with, God is doing great things through you, and I'm believing for greater things. Thank you for your faithfulness. Say hey to so-and-so for me. He had these real deep relationships with people. Did everybody in Paul's life do what he felt like they should do? No. I'm reminded of a story. Uh, Dylan and Emily are coming to sing a song in just a moment, but I'm reminded of a story of a guy named John Mark. <laughs> in 
Anybody that has two first names, you know something's going to go wrong. I know. I know, I know. <laughs> Sorry. Victor and Linda are wonderful counselors, and uh, if you need some encouragement. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> anyway. He had this guy named John Mark, who he called Mark a lot, but John Mark, who backs out of ministry. And Paul said, you know what? Fine. Don't bring him with you next time. But the Bible shows us, if you read on in the book of Acts, that God restores that relationship. Did you know, and I'll say this this way, I'm going to try to say this correctly, it is okay to be frustrated sometimes. Nobody needed to hear that? It is okay to be frustrated sometimes. But God wants you to push past your frustration. <laughs> you mean they did it again? You mean I got to go through this again? You mean they didn't learn last time? Aren't you thankful? that God never gave up on you. And so in your frustration, say, God, help me to push through this and love them anyway the way you loved me. Amen? <laughs> Some of the spouses in the room are saying, thank God. They still love me. They have to now, pastor said. <laughs> I've been praying about this service all week long. And I want more than anything for God to do something special in your heart and in your life. I want more than anything for the Holy Spirit to move right now in this moment. The Apostle Paul, we can look at the fruit of his ministry that is long and many, many people in the scriptures were impacted and still today. There's a song that Dylan and Emily are going to sing. And during this song, I want you to do a couple things. Number one, I want you to just evaluate where you are. Because maybe God wants to move you. Maybe God wants to change you from the inside out right now in this moment. Secondly, if you're here today and your heart is broken because you really did pray for the person on that card, you really did invite them to come to service, you really did reach out to them and you've done it again and again and again and you're at a place where you just, at the end of yourself, I wanna, I wanna just agree with you that the Holy Spirit can intervene in your life. The Holy Spirit can be your strength and rebuild your faith. Honestly, Sometimes the faith is weak. Sometimes we have a hard time believing God for miracles because we've asked and asked and asked and he hasn't done it. I don't know why, but I can tell you this much, it's not because he can't. So I want God to build your faith in this moment, but I also want God to change your life in this moment. So we're gonna bring the lights down. We're gonna go in just to an attitude of worship. And I'm going to invite you. I'm going to invite you, if you want to, come up here and seek the Lord on that person's behalf or come up here and seek the Lord on your behalf during this song. Come on, let's worship the Lord together. God, minister right now in Jesus' name.